guys, it's me, Rachel, here with Sense of Tempo Cunny Corso. So I'm out here with the puppies. Sun just came out for the first time in like days. Um, had to actually go get a hat. Um, so um, I wanted to take some time to do a video today about some things that um, I, some training methods that I do here that I know that some people um, don't really know why I do them or the basis of why they do them. And so I wanted to just kind of go into talking about that. Now, I do understand that um, some of these things are considered controversial. Um, there are people that don't agree with it. Um, they don't like it. And that's fine. Uh, everyone has a right to their own opinion. And everyone has the right to train their dog however they see fit. As long as you get the desired result of having a balanced dog that is um, well behaved, that you can take out in public and um, will behave itself and, and will not attack other dogs or people, then, you know, as far as I'm concerned, however you get there is fine so long as um, obviously you're not breaking any laws while doing so um, in the sense of like, you know, abusing your animals. But um, if you want to do positive reinforcement and you're able to get that result and, and you're able to get that result even when you don't have a treat in your hand, then that's awesome. Um, and if you're able to get it with a combination of treat training and um, discipline training like what I like to do, then that's awesome too. Whatever floats your boat, as they say. But I do want to go into what I do and why I do it um, so that there's no misunderstandings um, about what I do and why I do it. So... Uh, the number one thing that I do that I like to employ is called the alpha roll, um, uh, what I call a submissive posture. And, um, and the reason that I do it is because this is a behavior that dogs actually use amongst themselves. Um, when an animal wants to um, teach another animal that what they did was wrong or they want to teach them their position um, within the group, uh, they will often employ the um, submissive posture. And oftentimes even puppies, I mean, they, they're, they're born knowing how to do this because it's basic communication amongst dogs. And I've, I've shown this in videos. I've, I've had, um, I think it was actually Nirvana's litter I had out here. And, you know, they immediately submitted to Kashmir. She didn't have to do anything. Um, you know, they knew and, and they respected that. And I'll give you um, an example of how they knew without her really having to do anything. So I tell people all the time that back whenever I would go out and I would work with people's dogs, I had a dog training company and I would do dog training. And I tell people that I typically never had to, I never saw the same behaviors that the owners did because the dogs knew by my energy um, that not to kind of play those games with me. And the reason for that is because um, in the same way that imagine how back whenever you were in high school or maybe you're still in high school or grade school, how... Um, you go into a classroom and you can tell there's certain teachers where you can go in and you can tell right off the bat that that is a teacher that is not going to take any excuses. You know, they're not going to put up with any nonsense and they're the kind of teacher that, um, you know, you, you want to make sure that uh, you're doing everything by the book because they're really not going to put up with any misbehavior. And, you know, I have that tendency. Um, I have that energy about me and the dogs read that for me. And so, you know, that's the same thing that they read from Kashmir when they came out. They knew without her really having to do anything exactly where she stood in the pack and um, what they could and could not um, get away with with her. And so they automatically gave her the respect of going into submissive posture so that they were communicating with her that they respected her position and um, that's all good and healthy and very normal um, for dogs. And, um, and so because of the fact that I, you know, grew up with dogs and I love dogs and I, um, wanted to train them in a way that was easiest for them to understand, I use that technique. Um, I find it to be very effective. I find it to be something that they understand. And, um, and so I find it to be, um, a very successful, um, training technique. Now, like I said, there are going to be people that, that don't like it. And that's fine. Um, they may have their own reasons for, you know, feeling that way. And that's fine. Um, I know that I've seen some people say that, oh, the guy that there's like, they always say that, oh, the, the alpha theory was disproven. And, um, 
you know, it's, it's for me, that's, that's, you know, it's just ridiculous because, um, it's like, um, you can't disprove reality. You know what I mean? Like reality is what it is. Uh, just because a person observed something and then one day they decided to change their mind doesn't mean that it wasn't there to begin with. You know what I mean? Like, um, it just, it just is what it is. He may have changed his mind, but that doesn't mean that anything has changed. And I will say that I have really wanted to kind of clarify for people that, you know, I think the problem is the whole idea of like, um, of like a pack, you know what I mean? Because the reality is, is that you're right. Dogs are not packs and it is different dynamics. You know, packs are typically a mother and, um, father and their offspring. That, that is the truth. And if you were to ever watch, um, Kashmir with say her offspring, which would be, um, Blondie, Blondie is very naturally submissive, um, to Kashmir. Now that doesn't mean that you won't have situations where, um, lower, um, like, for example, a puppy might fight with its mother, something like that. It absolutely can and does happen. Um, but in general, um, what I have seen is that there is a clearer form of communication and respect from a um, puppy to its mother. And I think that naturally when a puppy uh, or, or a, a young adult decided that they no longer wanted to submit to their parents, they would in fact leave that pack and go out and start their own. You know what I mean? If they want to procreate, they're going to leave, they're going to do their own thing. So um, I do think that that's a very natural thing. And so sure, uh, me keeping so many unrelated animals together is actually very unnatural. However, within any group of social animals, there is a form of communication. And I think that when people think that, um, that it can be disproven, I would say to you, well, you know, I'm sorry, but you can even see this kind of stuff with humans. Um, you know, you have a boss, right? You have to submit to that boss. You don't have to literally lay down in submission, but, um, you know, there is a hierarchy in every aspect of human life. And um, whether it be the government, the police, um, you know, whatever it is, we we form all these hierarchies. And in every single company, you know what I mean, They're, that you're down to the bottom person all the way up to the top. And so I th there's a reason for that. Because when you have a group of social animals, there has to be a hierarchy in order to be able to maintain order. Because when there is an issue, you have to be able to figure out how to address that issue. And it can't always come down to fighting it out. You know what I mean? And so there has to be these kind of natural positions of authority. And we work those out as humans, um, in, in hierarchies through, you know, um, social status. So maybe that's employment or anybody that's ever worked in a prison or worked in a school, you'll see that even the, the, the people that are in those places, whether they be inmates or children in schools, they also form hierarchies. Um, you know, that's what the whole mean girl thing is about. So I, I think that we're kidding ourselves or people that believe that alpha theory is a, is a disproven theory. They're kidding themselves. They're turning a blind eye to the reality of all social animals. And, um, they've even found that there is hierarchy in, uh, great white sharks, which they thought were just these very lone predators. It's, you know, each for themselves. And the reality is, is that it's not when you watch great white sharks feeding on a carcass together, they actually have ways of communicating, um, status to one another. And, um, and, uh, basically it's the biggest one rules and, and there are behaviors that, that they will exhibit to kind of, you know, avoid conflict in those situations. And it doesn't mean that great white sharks are pack animals. It means that um, when they are in a social gathering, um, which they are because um, they will typically um, feed off of whale carcasses in those situations, they have forms of communication to be able to avoid all out brawls, right? Because it doesn't help any social animal to have to constantly engage in fights that could very well threaten the individual's ability to survive and feed itself. So there are these kind of safeguards through communication that they use. And um, we can pick up on those communications and those behaviors 
and um, we can use those to our advantage on how to communicate with um, animals that are in our uh, vicinity. And so what I've done is I've watched dogs um, in my life and I have learned what those communication methods are, those um, behavioral um, traits, and I've learned to kind of co-op them and use them to best communicate with um, my dogs and my pack. And it's also how I'm able to observe my dogs and I can predict what's going to happen, how it's going to happen, um, and why it's going to happen. Uh, because I'm able to read the body language and I can I can see what's going on and so um, So anyway, I prefer the natural way there are some people that prefer their way You know, they there are people that don't like the natural way. Maybe they think that it's mean uh, They think it's cruel and they would rather do it their way Which they think is the better way and maybe it's strictly positive and it's nothing but treats and love and even though that does not exist in nature um, it can produce um, positive results in some breeds. Um, and I would say, you know, I would say that that's limited. You know what I mean? Not even, not even all Labradors can be trained in that way. Now, it doesn't mean that, um, you know, treat training has its place, right? I use treat training all the time with my dogs to incentivize behaviors that, um, that that puppies especially you know don't know or like for example whenever I'm trying to bring these these puppies in so that I don't have to chase them all around the house you know I I will literally have a treat and I'll tell them you know come right and I have you know this little treat and um and you know and I'll you know toss the treats into the kennel and they go into the kennel right so there's nothing wrong with employing treats and in, in learning behaviors especially with young puppies but eventually you do need to have a dog that does what you tell it to do because you said so and there are going to be situations um, where for example if you have your dog at a dog park where you're going to need more than just a treat trained dog um, to kind of get the results that you want and a lot of the people that i've seen that are very pro treat training actually either a don't take their dogs to dog parks so they're not ever in those kinds of situations or B, um, they take their dogs to dog parks and their dogs are absolutely out of control. And they're the reason why people like me have to leave sometimes because they can't control their dogs. So, um, so anyway, so there are limitations to strictly positive training. Um, that's just the reality of the situation. I prefer a balanced training method, meaning that I use treats whenever it's necessary, whenever I think that it's going to work. And I don't, I don't allow it to be um, a handicap for me. Basically, I don't, I do, you know, you can lean on it too much if you're not careful. And then whenever you need the dog to listen, when it's not at all interested in a treat, um, you know, you may not be able to get that dog to listen to you and behave. Um, if you had actually done the continuation of that training, which is making sure that the animal respects you. Hold on. I got to go clean that up. One sec. Okay. Sorry about that. I had to clean that up. So, um, another training method that I employ, um, behavior is called the mouth bite. And, um, out of my two training methods, I think that's the one that people are the most kind of like, what is that kind of thing? I've seen a lot of people, um, you know, um, people who would see themselves as dog trainers, um, who just sit there and they're just like, oh my God, what is that? Blah, blah, blah. That's so retarded, blah, blah, blah. And the, um... And for me, I personally um, don't see it that way. So, you know, as many of you know, you've seen my, um, you've seen my videos with Cashmere um, and, and all my other dogs too. You've seen Preacher do it. Um, actually, I even have video of Batista doing it to Nirvana recently. But when the dogs want to discipline another dog for doing something wrong, they will often run in and they do what I call the mouth bite, which is where they will actually put the other dog's muzzle in their mouth and they'll, they'll bite down. Not hard, not enough to break the skin. Um, it's just, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a punishment. And, um, and so it's, you know, the thing about it is you have to think about the fact that dogs do not have hands, right? They, they don't have many tools at their disposal to communicate and they don't even have words either, right? So they, 
um, do their best to communicate with one another and the mouth bite is one of the ways that they communicate and in fact it is often something that you will see um, in wolf packs in fact if you ever look at the muzzle of the lowest pack member um, and really anybody that's lower on the totem pole in a wolf pack their muzzle is typically very scarred up um, from being um, had, had had so many mouth bites on them and some people would think that it's dumb and it's this and it's that and that's fine like I said people are allowed to have their own opinions they um you know I'm of the I'm of the point of you know you do you and I'll do me and unfortunately the rest of uh, the dog community isn't like that they think that their way is the right way and anything that's not their way is laughable and it's abuse and it's horrible and it's all this stuff and unfortunately that's just not so just because a person doesn't like something um, and has a very strong negative emotion attached to it doesn't make their feelings right or factual or correct it just means that you have a very strong emotional response to something that you've seen um and um and so anyway so you know some people have asked like what is that why does she do that what is that well it's 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 what the dogs do if, i mean if you think it's crazy then you must think dogs are crazy because they do it to each other and i personally don't think that it's crazy to mimic a dog an animal's behavior when you're training an animal the idea that somehow you should use a totally different method of communication that's foreign to them to me is crazy you know what i mean um i don't i don't see that as in any way being um logical you know i see logical as as using the animal's communication method um that is natural to them um to 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 better train them with so i like to be more raw and natural with my animals and that's why i employ the mouth bite um is it everyone's cup of tea no it's not and that's fine you know what i mean that's totally fine i personally don't employ everybody else's training methods it's not my cup of tea now i don't go around um you know talking trash about these people um, making groups and going out of my way to mock them i don't do that but um that's also because you know i'm i'm not that type of person so um so anyway so that's those are two things that i do that i think get the most um comments of why do you do this and or really negative commentary now a lot of you um have been watching me for a long time and you've actually started doing these kinds of training methods and i would really love to hear from you like if you had not done submissive posture before and if you had not done the mouth bite before and you did start to um, let me know if you've, you know, what your results have been, you know what I mean? Um, I would really love to hear it. Uh, if you've had a great experience with it, please comment down below. I would love to see how many people have actually benefited from learning about this and have kind of been able to, um, help their dogs with this kind of training method. So, um, other than that, I really wouldn't say that anything else that I do is any, is, is really particularly different. Um, you know, a lot of people use e-collars. Um, there are, um, you know, lots of, um, uh, lots of, um, companies that employ the use of, of, of e-collars for all forms of training, whether it be sit, stay, lay down. I mean, I want to say, I want to say that sit means sit maybe was one of them. I don't, I or off leash maybe I think it was actually um Reese said that she had a, a client of hers that was using them and they were using an e-collar on on her dog at a young age and they're a franchise so the idea that you would use an e-collar to teach a dog um, basic obedience is not a foreign concept now do I think that it should be the first tool that you go to absolutely not I think that um, ideally you would use treat training to um, encourage a dog to learn that new behavior and then once they understand that behavior and they can do it with with being asked to with a treat I do believe that then you should wean them off treats so meaning that maybe one time you ask them to do it and you give them a treat and maybe the next time you don't give them a treat and you just give them a pat on the head and I think that eventually they should actually do it because you told them to not because of the fact that there's any type of um, you know treat reward uh, involved because it's not practical that you would be able to offer a treat every single time everywhere you're at and not to mention a treat is basically a reward and um, you know let's say for example that 
uh, let's say for example that you're, you know, you like ice cream, right? Like I remember my daughter was, um, when she was in grade school or I don't know how, how people can, um, classify grade school, but she was in elementary school and she used to talk a lot. And so I used to tell her for every day that you don't get uh, reprimanded by your teacher for talking during class, I'll take you to McDonald's and I'll get you a little ice cream cone. Okay. That's a treat. Now it worked, um, until the days that she just wanted to talk. You know what I mean? And then it didn't matter talking about whatever conversation they were having or whatever was going on was more of a reward to her than the possible reward of an ice cream cone afterwards. And dogs are no different. Um, if, if, if what that dog wants to do is more interesting and more valuable to them than the treat that you're offering, then the treat will not work. And that's why for me, I don't think that it's responsible to rely a hundred percent just on treats. Um, so that's just my personal opinion. And, um, I always believe in weaning dogs off of treats. I think they're important. I think they're necessary. I think it's very helpful, but I don't think that it's the end all be all, um, you know, of, it's kind of like riding a bicycle and never taking the training wheels off. You know what I mean? That's the way that I see it. So, um, so anyway, so I, I just wanted to kind of talk about that and clarify that as to, you know, why I do what I do. And, um, and I think that that is, is what allows me to be able to have such a large pack of, you know, hormonal unrelated animals that are able to get along without trying to um, kill each other. And that's because I'm, um, I respect that they are dogs. I respect who they are. And I, um, and I go out of my way to communicate with them in a way that they will understand. And, and I think that that's a very natural thing to do. And, and I, I guess would caution people like I think that it's as society progresses I think that we get to a point where people are like well you know like is are they professional what 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 classes do they take this and that and people seem to forget that the 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 human race uh, is the race that domesticated the wolf and there were no professional dog trainers back then okay um the Native Americans that tamed Mustangs and rode them and um, were famed for, for, for using them in war and for hunting and all that, they were not professional horse trainers, okay? And so the idea that you need to be professionally trained in anything to be able to do something is 100% not factual. It, it, doesn't, um, it doesn't stand up to any type of scrutiny whenever you look at the way that society has developed. Now, the more and more and more that people separate themselves from nature by sitting on their phones and um, living in cities and not really interacting with nature, then absolutely people get less and less and less able to be able to um, understand and, you know, kind of um, work together with nature because they're just so far from it. You know what I mean? And we, we, I think to compensate, we tend to use like human psychology, right? We, um, look at, at books of psychology and we say, well, you know, um, this is what we should do, or this is not what we should do or whatever. You know what I mean? And I, I think that that is a, is the wrong way to go about it. Me personally, I believe in, in, in getting back to nature and respecting, um, the natural order and the natural behavior of these animals and working with them, not against them and pushing our own ideologies on them that makes us feel good. You know, if, if you can't employ my training because you don't want to be mean or you perceive it as mean and you think you're being a bad guy, that has nothing to do with the reality of dogs or the reality of canine behavior. It has to do with you and your emotions and your inability to separate your emotions from the reality of the situation. And um, I think that a lot of people don't realize that. So I just wanted to kind of really go into detail with that um, and kind of, you know, talk about that a bit. And just for all of our new subscribers that are here, just so they understand why I do the things that I do and um, where it comes from. And, um, and like I said, if you've had a positive experience from it, if you've learned, Valak, psh, no, no digging, then um, I would love to hear about that. You know what I mean? So I hope you guys are having a good day and um, I'll talk at you later.
Bye.